Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is our 22nd session at Hackaday Quantum Computing. So two weeks ago, we had our first guest lecture. Today, we have another guest lecture. I will introduce you, Ralph, in a little bit. Uh, before we go into that, just a reminder that all of the class materials are on Hackaday in the Quantum Computing Through Comics course. If you search in hackaday.io, you, you can find it. And usually we spend 30 minutes to an hour on Sunday on one concept. And it could be theoretical, it could be on hardware or programming. Uh, we also have been using the QSharp documentation from Microsoft and Quantum Katas as our exercises. If you look at some previous classes, you will find the materials and some classes involve coding. So as I mentioned earlier, we have been, uh, we, we just started our guest lectures. So last week uh, we had to change schedule for Professor Chris Furry, uh, but today we are very lucky to have Ralph here joining from the QSharp community. Uh, and Thank we you. have all these great lineups in the next few weeks. Uh, before we, uh, before I introduce Ralph, I also wanted to remind everyone that we have a lot of learning materials. And I like to show people this uh, community that is building the ecosystem together. So a lot of us in this class are curious hobbyists. But we have a lot of material that's out there that is available for you to upscale, up, upgrade your skills. So I want to uh, point people to the new MS Learn modules. Uh, we launched this a while back with two modules. And at Microsoft Ignite, we just launched another two modules. So now we have a learning path of four modules. The first one is to help you get started with coding QSharp. But if you need some uh, quantum concepts, you can also take a module on that. Uh, then we have a more deeper dive algorithm module on Google search. And then there is also a module on solving optimization problems. This is more theoretical. So I will highly encourage you to go through all of these. And I, I am very eager to see more people jumping from the curious hobbyists towards the more quantum uh, professionals. So I think Rob here is a great example of quantum developers and uh, who have been making a lot of contribution professionally to the quantum community. Uh, and also, I, I want to thank people for buying my book, <laughs> the, the Quantum Computing Comics book uh, now is available on Amazon in 13 markets. Uh, the best, actually, um, people, people like the drawings, but I think uh, to get the best results actually is to watch the classes of the corresponding topic. And on this side, you can even take notes. That's why I have this notes empty, empty pages for people to take notes while they walk through these uh, topics. So uh, this would be what I think the best way of using the comics book. OK, so without fur further ado, let's introduce Ralph Hausmann. Uh, I hope I pronounced my name right. Okay. Hausmann. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't welcome, matter. <laughs> welcome to our class at Hackaday on Sunday. Uh, Rolf, as I mentioned, has been an active member of the Q Sharp community. He actually organizes and manages it with uh, Dr. Sarah Kaiser. And the Q Sharp community is an open source community that's uh, driven by the community for uh, open source projects and contributions to the libraries for Q Sharp language. And Ralph is similar to a lot of us here. And I would also show the Q Sharp community website here. I pointed people to it some time ago. Uh, also, he's, he's a hobbyist uh, for a lot of interesting maker stuff. And he has his maker space. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, Today he is going to introduce to us the project Q-Trip. Uh, 
is a project that you can run on Microsoft simulators uh, using QSharp. And he's going to show us how we can work with it and how you can do your own uh, programming on simulators, uh, especially with the hardware limitations at the moment. Um, all of the recording will be posted very quickly after the class on both YouTube and Hackaday. And also, yeah, just a reminder, next week uh, I will be speaking at Zen for Maker on Google's algorithm. So we won't have a class on October 4th. So note the time change. If you want to join that class, you can go to Zen for uh, Maker. And then uh, the week after, we have Dr. Maria Schaut. Uh, talking about quantum machine learning. So a lot to look forward to. Thank you, Raf. Uh, I will give the screen to you now. Thanks. Let's see if this works. Feed number two. Can you see the screen? Yes, very good. Cool. So hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm Rolf Huisman. <laughs> I'm uh, talking for the, uh, like uh, like Katie already introduced, I'm a uh, part and one of the maintainers from the QSharp committee. Uh, in my daytime job, I'm an enterprise security architect, uh, architect for a um, multinational bank. So normally I'm not allowed to talk a lot about those kind of things, but in my private life, I live in the Netherlands. I'm, I'm Dutch, I have, uh, I'm a dad, and I really like to make and tinker with stuff. And I'm a real uh, big enthusiast of uh, quantum computing. And with all things that you really enjoy and really like to do, uh, when you're only alone, you're only alone, and you don't get together and do things and get, really get to talk about them. So uh, a while ago, and it's to the 27th of April already, uh, I had to look it up, it's more than a year ago, uh, together with uh, Sa Dr. Sarah Kaiser, uh, crazy for pie as we uh, nickname her sometimes, we together um, essentially set up a community for QSharp, the quantum language you already know from Microsoft. And on this site, we have uh, we, we talk together, we play together, uh, we have opportunities for blog uh, posts, and people usually communicate a lot. And in our open source community, we also have our open source projects in which we collaborate together. So we have two types of projects. Uh, the first type is the real Q sharp projects that are uh, libraries and, and things to, to, to program for. For example, um, Sarah together with uh, Ol Olivia uh, wrote the QRAM library, which is a library you can use for Q sharp to facilitate uh, the, the uh, possible uh, possibility of using essentially QRAM for machine learning. Uh, Sara uh, started uh, the Algorithm Zoo, which is a uh, uh, platform of re-implementing a lot of yeah, base algorithms, algorithms everybody knows from the textbook and show and see how they look in the, uh, in the essentially in the Q-sharp language. And uh, where I'm mostly focused on and, and, and what we also like to do is in essentially the tooling to make Q sharp better and to be able to make better use of it. And the, the tooling projects we have in that space is the Q sharp integrations, the uh, CHP uh, simulator and QFill, which is will be our latest edition, a new project that we're starting um, for, for our essentially our community. And we invite everybody to essentially have a round and think around with this. So <clears throat> what do we do? Uh, we have a Slack channel uh, in which we collaborate together, have, have fun, have chats, and we basically debug and, 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 and play around together with, with our fancy Q-sharp applications and the library. And you can see this, uh, this is a real screenshot from essentially our conversation. Here you see, for example, Amir as well. Uh, there are a lot of people which are interested and really want to learn. And, and once you have a problem, people really want to debug and get into the nitty gritty. So in our community, we now are starting a new project, and that's Project QFRIL. And that's what I want to talk about you. What is it? Why do we need it? And, and, and why do we, do we even need these kind of things? And to explain what QFRIL is, that's that multi, uh, that 
uh, ability to plug in multiple uh, simulators into Q Sharp. We also need to talk about our CHP simulator, which is essentially the same, but using uh, a more uh, specific purpose uh, attribution to it. I will show you, uh, once we've talked you through on, on what it does and how it does, I'm going to show you some uh, some demos. And um, of QFill, that one is a really early POC. Um, we only got that one compiling only a few days, uh, only a day ago. So let's hope that that one works. <laughs> and this is the first time it will run on Mac. So let's see if it works. Um, and then not call to action. So what is QFill? And, and why would we need that? Well, let's go back to that nice sheet that uh, we are collaborating on some code. Um, this was during the period that we were developing the QRAM library. So this was a, a very new opportunity where we, we, we were looking at, okay, how can you uh, make better use of qubits so that you have the ability to map to other points of data so that you can bring essentially for machine learning your data into your program. And uh, we were running in some small bugs and defects, uh, mostly in the face uh, algorithms. And then Amir said like, hey, uh, you know what? I'm just going to make a small export of this. Well, this is what that small export looked like. It was uh, 32 of these pages. And um, yeah, if, 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 if you have worked with larger programs, like the toy examples, you can still draw out on one screen. Uh, this one, even if you have an 8K monitor, I think you still would have to need some additional real estate on your on your desktop. Um, and, and we were looking at this and, and we were trying to debug this. And eventually, Olivia came around and he said like, yeah, oh yeah, I just switched around one T gate in this complete stack, uh, oh, oh, in this complete stack. And uh, yeah, we fixed it now. But as you can imagine, as, as, as if you are writing these kinds of programs and in reality you are building these kinds of programs, you need a better way of dealing with these. So there are multiple options to deal with this. I mean, we could have really big, powerful quantum computers to run these algorithms. Well, I think someone on the chat line is working on that. <laughs> We all, you could also have a big simulator uh, with a huge amount of RAM to be able to run these kinds of algorithms, which, yeah, basically for a community is not really feasible. So the path we are looking for and, and, and why we are looking in, into these kind of things is to break essentially pieces of these codes up, uh, pieces of, these, of the code up, and to be able to test them individually. And run them on specific purpose simulators that are capable of running that specific piece of code so we can test them in more situations. So how do we do that? Well, the Microsoft QDK stack, which uh, essentially gets shipped if you essentially download uh, the QSharp project and you start playing around with it, and a lot of you probably have, they basically have four uh, simulators already in the box. There is the real full state simulator, which can handle all the uh, uh, can handle all the operations. But that one, if you start using more than, for example, uh, thirty uh, qubits, requires so much RAM that you basically can't run it on a normal machine anymore. You need to scale out to, for example, Azure Quantum later on, uh, hosted service for us. Um, but if your problem that you wrote down and basically uh, developed is small enough and only contains, for example, Toffoli gates, X and C nodes in there, you're also able to uh, use the Toffoli simulator from Microsoft. That one can handle a lot more qubits, but the downside of it is it can't handle things like Hadamard gates or phase gates, and it can only measure in the Pauli Z axis. There are also some other simulators which are special purpose for things like resource and estimators and trace simulators. But for our, if we really are starting to test large applications, when we start to really test algorithms, yeah, you need to be able to focus them out. So these are quite useful. How could you build your own? Well, uh, a while ago, <clears throat> we had a community project uh, called the CHP simulator. That's a simulator based on CHP sub theory. 
and that one can do Hadamard, uh, the phase gate, and the CNOT. Uh, in and because of that combination, also the Pauli X in all axes of the Pauli, uh, in all measures of, of of boundary. This will already allow you to test things like uh, linear error correction, teleportation, uh, dense quantum coding, and and GH and the GHZ uh, paradox. And we were really. Uh, essentially plugging into the quantum language where we can still make use of the quantum, uh, the Q-sharp language as a DSL, but essentially add our own plumbing and tooling in there so that we can, and you will see later on in the demo, can run much bigger programs than you normally would be able to. So this made us wonder. We, we, we were developing this and Sarah developed this uh, online on her Twitch stream. And, and we wonder like, how far can we take this? Well, that's where QFRIL comes in. Um, if you're familiar with the Q-sharp language, the name of Q-sharp, it's a little bit based on the C-sharp name, right? And C-sharp was originally a music symbol, which was C++, and if you add plus plus to it, you get a sharp symbol. So what we thought is that, what we want is something that is more melodical, like uh, multiple vibrations in the tone of our system, and it, it needs to be in the same theme. So that's why we called it Frill, and because every quantum computing language needs a Q in front, we called it QFRIL. So what do we want? Well, we want to keep Q-sharp as the DSL, as we already said, because that's where the value of Q-sharp is. It allows you to essentially deploy to multiple uh, target systems, and it will allow you to reason in a uniform way about quantum computing. But we want to take out blocks of code and test them individually. Uh, Q-sharp allows you to have unit tests, and those unit tests also allow you to, get, to specify which specific uh, simulator you want for that specific piece to be tested. And we want to test them uh, with specific noise models because if you're developing, for example, for real hardware, you would see that you also want to encompass like, okay, we have these deviations, we have these systems and, and, and test for them with a huge number of qubits. So that boiled us down to, we really need to have an ability to essentially plug in multiple simulators. And what the CHP, um, uh, simulator talk to us is that, yeah, given that we already know how to make our own simulator, why don't we hack this together? And that's basically where the project A was. And it's currently in the POC phase. We're currently testing multiple options. And our intent is really to plug in multiple specific uh, quantum simulators. And you know, um, an, an, an another option would be that, yeah, there is there was on Hackaday this 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 quantum uh, computer, and somebody tried to build it himself. Well, nobody would be foolish enough to redo that and try connecting Q sharp to that. So let's not talk about that one for now. So, if you look at Q Q thrill and what we are currently working on and, and, and how we see the world is there are three different types of simulators. You have the incremental simulators and basically you have your program running and the world starts um, and your program essentially interweaves with your simulator. For example, if you execute an Hadamard gate, oh, the Hadamard gate is executed in a simulator and you essentially go back and forward. The QDK simulators are like this. You also have to stop the world simulators, where you basically have a complete program, you throw it in your simulator, the world stops, it gets executed, you get, uh, you get a result back, and you process out again. And you have the concurrent types, where you hand over the gates, and essentially the simulator runs on the back and start processing them. Because the QDK is incremental, the current infrastructure that we have is also built for the incremental world. And our current plans are to work around that limitation, essentially, of how those processes work by essentially either having uh, milling the top out of the top of a third party uh, simulator. And we have done that before, and it works quite well, that we can have existing simulators run in process. Or we, uh, or for the uh, for the for the simulators where we're not able or allowed to do so, we want to build a harness that we can essentially have a stop the world simulator executing individual jobs, and process them. So, 
why is this fun? Well, <laughs> this is really fun because this is uncharted territory. Nobody knows on if we're going to plug that in, how everything is going to react and, and what the end of the possibilities are the, uh, about this. We're currently in the design and prototyping phase, right? And that also means that we're currently validating if this works, and we think it does. Um, the prototypes and the prototype going to show you, hope, hopefully it works. And I will be able to show you that the, the concept works, but we're really in looking at like, okay, how would we do this the best way? How can we integrate that? If you really like these kind of things, well, <laughs> we're going to send out a deck. Join us. It, this is really fun material to, to, to talk about. So let's talk a bit on how technically we are going to do this. And for that, I'm going to give you some inspiration and what was our inspiration for our QFIL simulator, which was the CHP simulator. So the CHP simulator, and Sarah started this one, is based on the stabiliz stabilizers um, theorem of, of Gottsman from uh, 1996. It can handle uh, Hadamard, uh, Phase, and C0, uh, and, and therefore within that space also the Pauli exclusion uh, in, in, all, in all axes. And you can find it in the bottom link uh, if you really want to see how it technically works. So... If you look at these gates, because people will usually ask why these gates, if you look at these gates, you would see that the Hadamard has, um, has the ability to go from the zero state to the plus state, from the one state to the minus state. The phase state can bring from zero to zero, from one to I, and etc. etc. None of these gates, essentially, and that's also why they're called Clifford gates, can bring you to essentially all the substates of, of the block sphere. And that's an opportunity where we can make use of. So for example, where you probably have seen this block sphere where every point on the block sphere is a possible state in your application, in the CHP set, you only have six states from one qubit. And that will uh, that will allows us to massively compress the states that we use using um, Hey, here we go, uh, using Pauli matrix multiplication. So what we do is we use group theory. And if you want to know it in much more detail, there is the paper from Ahrens and, uh, and Gottsman. But basically what this allows us is to simulate this specific set in a very efficient way on a classical computer, as long as we keep to these gates. Well, okay, that's the theory of a CHP simulator. How do we connect it up to the Q Sharp language? Well, there are basically three ways of connecting a program up to the Q Sharp language. You can build and plug in your own simulator. And that's basically how our um, Q Frill, uh, sorry, how a CHP simulator works and how our Q Frill proof of concept currently works. Other options would have been the custom compiler extension. So if you really want to rewrite code and do all the other stuff, Q Sharp has the ability to do those kind of things. Another option, and it's uh, it came out on Wednesday, that's the QIR or Quantum Intermediate Representation, which is basically the MSIL language for quantum computers later on. And we are currently looking at if we can make it work, use it, but that will probably be our focus for Q for later on. So let's go back to the uh, QH, uh, to the CHP simulator. How do you build your custom simulator? Well, first let's discuss on how a Q sharp is normally executed. You normally have a Q sharp program and it has its uh, host program, which is technically optional, but under the hood you always have that. And it executes the Q sharp programs. And it executes the programs against uh, either a quantum device, which they call a target machine, or basically the simulators. And the way this technically works, and you can plug and play this without changing the Q-sharp code, is that if you have, for example, the program on the left, and this is within uh, Visual Studio Code, um, uh, a lot of you might uh, use more the Jupyter Notebooks for this, so this is the uh, code representation as you would see it in a, in a development studio environment where you have an application with A and B, and you have the Hadamard gate executed, the C not gate executed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For all of these steps, 
in the simulator, and this is uh, a class depending um, which extends the uh, quantum processor base, all the methods are called for all these gates. So for example, the Hadamard gate, the H function is called for the C0 gate, the C0 function is called. And by implementing your own version of these, you can build up essentially your own simulator. So if you do that correctly, and, and this is a, an export of, 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 of how the botnet looks like, on the top you see the left program using uh, using the traditional uh, full state quantum simulator, which uses matrix multi multiplications to essentially execute uh, the program. You see that the end result on the bottom is zero, zero, as you would expect. And on the bottom side, you see that uh, with the .NET command lines, you can plug in our own simulator, which does the same, which does all the interesting stuff with the matrices and all the other stuff, and also executes the same. Well, and it also executes with the same zero, zero. So that way we basically don't change the program, but we can plug in different simulators. So let's show that in real life. So what program am I going to use for the Q Sharp and for these demos? Well, uh, Sara is currently working on the algorithm zoo. And one of the algorithms, uh, zoo uh, applications she, uh, she implemented is the Bernstein uh, Fazi Rani, probably going to butcher that name, sorry. <coughs> so this, com this, this class essentially is implementing as a community uh, all of the uh, algorithms that are on the uh, quantum algorithm zoo page and we're going to implement them one by one and we'll add them as public contributions so everybody can see and have uh, a crack at them so if i take that algorithm and this is the uh, q sharp version on uh, my laptop in uh, visual studio code because i'm more of a developer person so i like this kind of infrastructure what you see is the uh, Bernstein, uh, the Bernstein, uh, let's call it Bernstein for now, uh, algorithm where you have been given an oracle and that oracle uh, function has a hidden uh, has a hidden value. And the, what the algorithm does is basically by querying, it tries to determine what value is in that oracle function. And normal on a classical computer, uh, you would get a list and you would need to execute all kinds of combinations. Uh, but for a quantum computer using superposition, we can just say basically query them all and have out what the oracle function is. So let's test this algorithm on a, on a classical computer. Is this screen big enough for people or not? No? Uh, yeah. Yeah. See that. Okay. See me. There are some questions in the chat. We can get to it. I don't know if you want to. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. I, I, I can't see the uh, the, the query uh, the query scenes, uh, screen. So if you can tell me. Yeah, there's uh, two questions from Sumit. One is, uh, was the quantum class in C sharp? Uh, the uh, simulators are the simulator extensions as we wrote them are in C sharp. Yes. And then the second question, is, uh, oh yeah, is the same. So they're asking if it's in stabilizer processor. Yeah, the stabilizer processor um, is the, um, I, I, I have them here. The stabilizer processor is basically the uh, component which plugs in the runtime essentially. That one gets called for all, all the gates. And this code is public on the GitHub page, by the way, if people want to review and see this. So this is my application, and I'm now going to run the application on the traditional simulator. So this is the quantum simulator, .NET run, the project sample, quantum simulator. I put it the secret. That's just the secret I'm going to put in the Oracle. I'm going to query. And then I'm, I'm going to execute this with 16 qubits. Ah, Sarah is also uh, providing the links. Thank you, Sarah. So this is running on my machine, and what you see is, is that it executes and I get the same results back. So this, uh, so what we build is a, a, the simulator, the CSP stabilization simulator. 
Oh, that's a little bit too much uh, for now. And what you see is, is I can execute the same program and it will give me the same results, hopefully. Yes, <laughs> it still gives me the same results back. So how does how does this work with this with the simulator? So what we have, and uh, it's, it's how you can plug this in, is we have a process simulator, which uh, uh, extends from quantum processor dispatcher, which basically creates a custom class which will be hooked up into the runtime. And you can specify this class, and that's the name of, of uh, which is specified with the simulator tag. Oh, do you want the text bigger? Oh, sorry. Which you can, uh, which essentially creates and hooks in the, uh, the real simulator that you want to execute. And the real execute simulator is in stabilizer processor. And basically that one contains the override methods from the processor, uh, quantum processor base, which are the components which get executed. If you go even deeper, you will see all the uh, plumbing and definitions and, and how we implemented the rest. Uh, but basically, this is how the glue of uh, the Q-sharp language and the um, uh, our custom simulator interact together. And and that's and that's and you and you can play uh, and you go on and on and on back and forward. So this is nice. But if I already have a simulator from Microsoft, why should I implement this? Well, the problem comes once you start getting into this territory. The Q-sharp also compiles to IL. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, this Q-sharp uh, program gets uh, parsed. And uh, if you look in the object directory, you can see the uh, components at which it's got, uh, got implemented to. Uh, sorry, this one. It, it gets, uh, on the back, it gets compiled to this uh, C-sharp file, which basically calls back the simulator. And this is compiled into the DLL. And that is, is an IAL for now, but if in the future, for example, if you have a target machine, you would have other stuff poking in here. So today, yes, it, today it compiles to IAL. So going back, if I have my quantum uh, project and suppose this application would be a lot bigger, and I now want to simulate this with 60 qubits. So, okay, I'll execute this with 60 qubits using the traditional uh, simulator. And nothing happens. It's it's silent. I can't do anything. And the re if you look at my uh, process statistics, you will see that the .NET runtime will grow, will grow, will grow. Well, it's currently at uh, five gigabytes. It will eventually stop at 16 because there is only 16 gigabytes in this machine. And then it will die like, hey, I'm out of memory. I can't simulate that many qubits. So this, this won't work for these kind of programs. Well, okay, let's try the other one. Let's do this one with 60 qubits. Oh, here's the result. Does this mean that the full state uh, uh, simulator is bad? No, definitely not. This simulator is specifically purpose for these kinds of simulations, which only cre only make use of the Hadamard gate, this uh, the Hadamard gate, the Pauli exclusion gate uh, in the x-axis, and essentially the phase and the C naught. And that's why this is able to essentially for those specific use cases, if you plug it in, you're able to simulate much, much bigger um, uh, quantum computing devices. You can even, um, and I will show you this, by default, uh, we fill it with uh, 1024 qubits. Yeah, just because we can in the simulator. So even if you have really, really big programs, and if you don't just have these, um, if you just use these gates, yeah, you can still run them. Okay, so that's nice. Um, so how does, uh, so, so this is how you can plug in your own telemetry and how you can essentially plug in your own uh, simulators this way. So uh, what does this look for QFRIL? Well, in the case of QFRIL, and this is a very early prototype. I have here a very uh, 
in C, uh, some from a research paper, I got a version of a simulator uh, by Scott Arison himself, uh, who wrote a simulator in C to just execute these kind of things. And this is in hard-coded C, it compiles to, uh, to a real native program, can't run it. Okay, so how do I plug this then in? And that's basically where our first prototype uh, is essentially capable of doing. So by switching that one around, and now I need to do this switcheroo. And I really hope this one works. Uh, this is sample. This is the QFill simulator. Bum, 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 bum. Did we break? Yes, we break. Uh, that's the nice thing about beta applications. Need to recompile, sorry. <laughs> we can, but what, you, what you're seeing is, is that we're switching around simulators on the fly, and this will be as easy as switching machines later on as well. This really proves that the Q Sharp language is really a language that is not dependent on what kind of hardware or simulator is below that. And essentially a DSL, which yeah will allow you to reuse this later on as well. Okay, attempt number two. Off. So what you see now is, is that I switched out the, the simulator and it's now using the, uh, the research paper simulator from uh, Scott Aronson and I'm using this in the Q-sharp language. Notice I didn't change anything. I just plugged it in and it works. And this is our intention to go even beyond this, to have more uh, ability and I get the correct result, which is not unimportant. So I now have... <clears throat> I now have the ability to plug in all kinds of simulators and what we want is to even have more types of simulators so we can really focus our the sets that we want to test on. So let me get back to my deck. So this is one of the projects that you see on the GitHub page uh, that we are currently working on. But there are much more fun things that we have as well. So like I said, we have the algorithm zoo and we also are working on quantum, uh, we also worked on the quantum ROM uh, and quantum ROM memory libraries to execute on those. And these are really fun things to do. And don't do those things alone, do those things together. It's much more fun because if you're alone, you're just alone. So come join us if you don't want to be left behind.